Here we go. It's it's on now. And, and the link is on Facebook. Or well, well, now, I just came up on YouTube. Here we go. Okay, I, I'm seeing it on Facebook too. And, and the link is on Facebook. Or well, over now, I just came up on YouTube. Yep, we're good to go. Here we go. Okay, I, I, I'm seeing it on Facebook too. All right. Well, thank you very much, folks. We're working through some technical difficulties, but we are on top of the game with our, uh, with our uh, IT department. They're making it work. I'm going to ask that if anyone is not speaking, that you go ahead and go on mute so we don't have any feedback. So let's start this thing over. We're going to do it right this time. The Committee of the Whole meeting for October 20th, 2020 is hereby called to order. Clerk, I'm going to ask you to call the roll one more time just so everyone knows that all the aldermen are present. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, Alderman Yamas. Here. Alderman Garza. Here. Alderman Masiakos. Here, present. Alderman Donnell. Here. Alderman Franco. Here. Alderman Seville. Here. Alderman Hartburns. Here. Alderman Smith. Here. Alderman Bug. Here. Alderman Lache. Here. Alderman Jenkins. Here. Alderman O'Connor. Here. Mayor Irvin is present. On June 26, 2020, the governor of Illinois issued a statewide disaster declaration related to public health concerns. As head of this body, I've determined that an in-person meeting or meeting otherwise conducted in accordance with the Open Meeting Act is neither practical nor prudent because of the disaster. This meeting will be conducted by internet teleconference without the physical presence of a quorum. Prior to the commencement of this meeting, all members of this body were verified that they can see and hear one another. I further find that the physical presence of members of the public is not feasible at this meeting due to the disaster. And more specifically, the practical difficulties associated with accommodating the public in an accessible, hygienic location that allows for appropriate social distancing. Alternative arrangements have been made to allow the public to contemporaneously hear all discussions and roll call votes live on the city's official website, on Facebook, on YouTube, and via Zoom teleconference. Notice these arrangements have been given in accordance with the Open Meetings Act. The public may address this body consistent with the rules previously adopted and recorded and as adapted by Mayor Lord. I, Mayor Richard C. Urban, physically present in our regular meeting location as those terms are defined by resolution R20-124. All votes shall be conducted by roll call and a verbatim record of this meeting shall be made and maintained in accordance with the Opens Meetings Act. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of October? So move. Okay. Okay. There's been a motion made by Alderman Hart Burns, seconded by Alderman Garza. The clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Yamas? Yes. Alderman Garza? Yes. Alderman Masiakos? Yes. Alderman Donnell? Yes. Alderman Franco? Yes. Alderman Seville? Yes. Alderman Hart Burns? Yes. Alderman Smith? Yes. Alderman Bug? Yes. Alderman Lafshay? Yes. Alderman Jenkins? Yes. Alderman O'Connor? Yes. 12 days. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to offer public comment? We do not, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next section of the agenda, the committee re report. Chairman Seville, can you give the Building, Zoning, and Economic Development Committee report, please? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the bz &E Committee met October 14, 2020. The first item on our agenda is 20-0554. This is an ordinance granting revisions to the special use permit for its social service agencies, charitable organizations, health-related facilities, and similar uses when not operated for pecuniary profit uh, use on property located at 680 South Street or South River Street. This is across the street from the current Hesed House on South River Street. So um, move. Because of the COVID-19 um, uh, epidemic, they've had to uh, change their spacing requirements. Uh, and didn't have enough space for beds for people that needed to sleep there. Uh, and so the uh, space across the street will allow uh, emergency housing and overnight sleeping uh, to the tune of 165 uh, extra beds, which they desperately need. Consent. I was no objection. There's no objection to side of going consent. Consent, okay. Uh, the next two items are related. Uh, 20-0587 is a resolution requesting approval of a final plat for lots 1B and 3 of West Ridge Corporate Center, resubdivision phase 3, located at 801 Bilter Road, 
And the second one is 20-0589, a resolution requesting approval of the final plan revision for lots 1B and 3 of West Ridge Corporate Center Resubdivision Phase 3, located at 801 Builder Road for a warehouse distribution and storage services. You, so they need uh, an expansion of parking. Uh, they're looking to build 50 uh, extra semi uh, truck uh, parking stalls. Uh, they have to go actually into the retention area. So they'll be building a retention wall and add some really nice landscaping and improvements. Consent. Consent. No objections, Adam will go on consent. Consent on both, okay. And then lastly, Mayor, uh, 20-0632, an ordinance amending 020-028 granting additional time for compliance of the special use for a cannabis suspension facility at 35 North Broadway. That was granted on April 28, 2020. Uh, the reason for this request because of the delays in COVID-19 uh, and processing through the state of Illinois, their request. So they're requesting uh, that we give them another uh, six months uh, until next year. Alderman Bob. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if staff could and looking at this, of course, it's very timely as uh, the ceremony we had this morning. But if another entity came in uh, that already had all of their uh, approvals from the state and wanted to go into the downtown area, um, would they be prohibited? I mean, do we we're we're leaving this open for them for a year, and no one else can go into that. Um, yeah, I can answer that. Uh, Tracy Basic uh, with the Planning and Zoning Division. Yeah, if we did extend this for the six months, the mile and a half uh, regulation uh, would still uh, be in place. So uh, it would uh, not allow another uh, cannabis, or cannabis dispensing facility to apply for a special use in the downtown. Right now, at, nope. the, at this point, they haven't awarded the licenses. Um, we don't know when the governor is going to award the licenses. So at, at, at this point, I, I, I'm not even sure that the extension for the six months is going to affect any other uh, uh, dispensing facility. So, okay. So if, if another uh, entity had a, uh, a medical dispensary somewhere else in the state, they'd already have their plus one, right? Correct. So, they would have so a if they wanted to come into the downtown, they already have theirs, they wouldn't be able to? Correct. Because right now, the mile and a half, um, you, you cannot have another dispensi uh, dispensing facility within a mile and a half of a existing special use. Um, so this existing special use um, does, or if, if the extension is, uh, you know, granted, then this mile and a half would would limit any other one coming into the downtown. Okay. Do we know how many uh, medical dispensaries have the plus one or are looking for locations? I don't know that offhand. Um, I, to tell you the truth, honestly, uh, we have not had uh, any inquiries about additional uh, dispensing facilities um, uh, in the last probably, three or four months. Tracy, you have a question. We could just put this on unfinished. I would be happy with that. Alderman Lofty. Tracy, is there a way that we could do this, not only for the downtown, but for anywhere? If someone comes in and locks up a location, but I mean, I, I assume you guys, I mean, do you spend the time vetting them? Or is it just anybody who applies, who goes through the process? And I guess the question is, can we, can we do this so it's not, they're not prohibiting someone else who is qualified or gets a medical license. Is there a way to do it or not? Well, we, I mean, we do vet them as, as they come in and we make sure that they meet all of the requirements. Uh, we can't necessarily, I guess, pick and choose if you want to say, um, but we do uh, make sure that they meet all of the requirements that are, are set forth in the zoning ordinance. But could there be a way that for all these that we grant that if someone else comes in that does have a license, we could kick out their, you know, their one and a half mile restriction so we could get something open? 
unfortunately, the, the mile and a half is a restriction that you guys uh, did enact in the zoning ordinance. So there's not anything that we can do. So if, if one has already gone in or has gotten an approval, they, they do have that um, 180 days to get the license. This is most likely this won't be an issue um, once um, we kind of get back to normal. The, the problem is right now is that, that the state has delayed the awarding of the licenses. So um, they haven't had the ability to get a license um, because the state hasn't awarded one. So it's, it's not, this, this won't be an issue in the, the future. We have made that very clear in our ordinance that they only have 180 days to get this. What, why they're asking for the extension is really due to the state not issuing the ordinance or, or the licenses, I'm sorry. Um, so I really don't think that this will be a, a issue in the future. Unfortunately, just with um, everything that has happened in the shutdown and, and COVID, um, this, the state just has not issued these. Alderman Jenkins. So I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. So let's say if the uh, company uh, that requested the Bloom Holdings requested, and they they were not issued. They they were denied. So then that would open up the spot in the downtown, correct? Yeah, they <laughs> it would be extended to basically until um, April twenty eighth, two thousand and twenty one, to get a license. If they did not get a license, this um, the the special use would be. Ex uh, would be terminated basically. And then it would open it up again to have another one come in and be able to get a license in the downtown area. Okay, thank you. This will go on finished. Okay, okay, that's the report from bz &E. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman O'Connor, can you give the finance committee report please? Yes, sir. Item 20. 0399, a resolution authorizing Trotsky Investigative Polygraph Inc. as the provider for services of pre-employment polygraph assessments uh, continued through December 31st, 2020. Uh, this is a situation where we had contracted with them. Uh, they're going to go over the $25,000 limit by reason of some additional work by the end of the year, so we have to authorize it at this point. Consent. With no objection, side of one consent. Item 20 0400 is a resolution authorizing Standard and Associates as the provider for services of pre employment psychological assessments through December 31st, 2020. This is the same condition in, in regard to these assessments. Consent. We're going to go over the 25,000. With no objection, side of one consent. All right, thank you. 20-0495 is a resolution requesting approval to utilize community development block grant funds for Tinker Works uh, for delivery of science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, STEAM, training to 634 of Aurora's underserved youth in the amount not to exceed $100,000. Consent. We have, uh, we have Mr. Begas on the line. I'm not sure if Dr. Holloway is, uh, if they want to give a uh, some additional comments on this. I think everybody received a pretty extensive amount of information in regard to this uh, particular program. Right. Um, I think we went over this in the finance, but just very briefly in the summer of 2020, we uh, <clears throat> conducted a prototype training in partnership on uh, City Aurora and Tinkerworks. It was focused on the uh, K through eight um, uh, STEM community for the underserved. Uh, Tinkerworks, the provider, focus on transforming those learners into innovators, and we basically launched a this training focused on 50 of those underserved uh, uh, students in this enrichment camps. The grades were six through 12. Um, with that, we do have the deck that Alderman um, O'Connor provided. It is an 18-page deck. We do not intend to go through that, but we do have Dr. Anu. Uh, Maha Jin on the line. He's the CEO from Tinkerworks to uh, provide a executive overview and any address any questions. But before we get there, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Holloway to see if she has any caveats I'd like to add anything. 
Thank you, Michael. So what we're asking for is the utilization of community development block grant funds to support the continuation of this program that's going to now allow for many other young people to be able to participate. We have received um, approval of the use of CDBG from funds from HUD. Um, so now what the next step will be will be the moving forward of a substantial amendment approval to city council as well. So I think at that point, um, we can listen to the Tinker Works expert unless there's some questions related to CDBG. Any questions from the Alderman? Mr. Mayor. Alderman Hard Burns. I'm happy that uh, Alderman Garza and I had the opportunity to be the Aldermans who work with the, the initial program with our low income students. It was a great program for our kids. I'm just grateful that the students had a chance to make drones as well as computers. Um, I know during the pandemic, you know, things didn't come out the way we thought initially, but at the end, we have students that knows how to make drones as well as computers. I was excited to see the ability of the students and the help that they were able to receive. Tinkerwork has um, shown me to be a great program. Uh, and then for us as a city now to be given more money toward it, I'm looking forward to us pulling together the minds of young people that may have struggled in the past, but now they'll be able to excel. This program that I saw with the students that, that was in the program, they have learned a lot during a crisis time, they have given them hope for the future. I'm grateful that one and I was chosen because we do have students that was willing to learn and need to learn during this program. The hardship that we may have faced trying to pull it together, it turned out to be a jewel because we have students, 50 students, that have learned how to make drones. And I, I, just can't, I just can't get over that part. So I'm grateful, I think, that we should support this program because it's what's going to help us in the future. The young people are our future. And if we don't teach them now, when will be the time to teach them? Thank you. When will be the time? And Dr. Anu, I see that you, uh, you've joined us on. Would you like to uh, add a little bit to your, your program that you brought to us? Sure, I would enjoy the opportunity. First off, let me just say to the committee, thanks so much for affording me some time here to chat about the program. And thanks in general to the city of Aurora. We've really appreciated the partnership and the plug in with you and definitely hope we have the opportunity to do so as we move forward. So as Mr. Peggy's mentioned, um, you know, we formed a relationship with the city of Aurora back in the summer of 2020, just a few months ago. And we were fortunate enough to engage with roughly 50 students within the community uh, with our programming. Um, I think it's worthwhile for me to talk a little bit about Tinkerworks first and then dive into the results, meaning the impact of the overall program. As a company, our focus is very simple. We are a K through eight STEM education company that focuses on transforming learners to innovators. So our fundamental thesis is that schools do a wonderful job of providing knowledge around key subject matters to children, but because of a variety of constraints, these children don't have the opportunity to really um, apply those learnings, thereby deepening the impact of the learning. And that's really where we step in. Think of us as the application arm to schools. And what we do, quite simply, is we pose challenges to children to solve, problems for the kids to solve, and what we do through the use of our curriculum and through our kits is work with these children who then create tangible and physical solutions to these problems. So it's not paper-based solutions. They're actually physically creating something, tangibly creating something. And the best part is at the end of the day, they get to take it home. So when they learn that at the onset, they are very vested in the program. And that's as Alderman Hartburns, thanks so much for the warm words. But that's one of the primary reasons that we see such high engagement levels, simply because the children get to immerse themselves in creating something and then take them home. So if I now start diving into some of the projects that we did with the city of Aurora, 
Um, we worked on two projects this summer with the children. Uh, one was focused on electronic forms of artwork, bringing artwork to life that the children designed. Uh, and secondly, uh, around uh, uh, robots and drones. Uh, we posed for the older kids, those in grades third through six, uh, they were able to put together robots that they built, they wired up, uh, and then they coded to bring to life in the form of lights, sounds, and motion. Uh, overall, I have to emphasize it was a really wonderful uh, and innovative collaboration, I would have to say, because this was at the peak of COVID, as we all know. So the way we work together with the city of Aurora is uh, we did not have our instructors on site with the children. Instead, uh, there was a classroom that the children were gathered in. There was a person from Aurora who was supporting the delivery of our projects, meaning someone who was supporting the children as they made their way through the curriculum. And then the way it worked is there was a screen at the front of the room uh, using the wonderful technology of Zoom. Our lead instructor was zoomed into that screen and was working hand in hand with that onsite uh, representative to guide the kids through the uh, through the products. It was really wonderful to see how the kids took to it. So um, through that delivery, uh, we had some wonderful outcomes that, that resulted. Uh, to measure these actual outcomes, what we did is we provided children in the program pre-surveys as well as post-surveys. This These surveys, in addition to grabbing key demographic information regarding ethnicity, regarding uh, age, regarding a whole host of different items, also focused on measuring the children's desire and happiness in learning about coding, program, uh, computer coding, uh, desire to build, also their happiness and des their desire to learn about certain subjects. So if I may, if we go over, to, yeah, this is a perfect page here. I'm not gonna go through the entire deck, I promise you there's a lot of statistics here, but I wanna highlight just really five key things that came about through the outcomes here. Uh, first of all, one of the key points we wanted to emphasize in terms of success, success metrics going into it is we wanted to ensure we had a diverse population of students here. If you take a look at the middle graph here, what you will see is that 40, um, is that 44% uh, of the participants were black slash African American and uh, roughly uh, let's see, 9% were Hispanic or, you know, Latino. So we're looking at 53% of the overall population being Black, African American, or Latino itself. So I think, you know, it was fantastic to see that. Similarly, we also saw that the participants within the program, again, this was targeted uh, to children from first to sixth grade, uh, by and large, 75% of that population were aged 9 to 12. So really the sweet spot. For what it's worth as we move forward, I think there is opportunity to engage with perhaps some of the older children, more so in seventh and eighth grade, things of that nature. But again, this was focused on first through sixth grade. So overall bottom line here from that first outcome, diverse population targets were achieved. Secondly, um, in terms of the overall interest in science and technology, this graph I actually do wanna take a moment to show you. Mr. Peggy's, would you mind, I think you have control. Can you go down um, a couple of slides? You know, I'll tell you, keep going, keep going. Yep, keep going, uh, keep going, keep going. Another one, and I think one more, this is it. All right, so what we did, and again, I realize that there's a lot of bars and numbers here, but let me just uh, tell you a little bit about the question we asked these children. Before they started the Tinkerworks camp, we asked them a very simple question. How do you feel about the following subjects? And you can see on the bottom there, we asked about art, music, technology, math, science, ELA, PE, and social studies. And then what we did is we had them run through the camp and we asked them that same question without any, you know, without any means of influence. Literally, it was just given to them. The kids responded without us interacting with them. And so what you can see is for areas of art, math, ELA, PE, and social studies, for the most part, it remained relatively constant. But what I'll guide your eyes towards is the increase in enjoyment around technology, math, and science. To me, this was quite, you know, quite a revelation. I mean, we're always talking about, uh, as educators, as community members, trying to figure out how best to spark an interest in science, mathematics, technology, 
And what we saw here just through this relatively small sample size in the summer is that we were able to achieve that. So I just wanted to, to pause and share that one slide with you as well. Then also, <laughs> no need to really talk about other slides. I'll just highlight a couple of remaining outcomes that I wanted to, to showcase to you. Um, going into the program, uh, based on the responses by the children, they had a strong desire around creating and building items. They said that, hey, there's a couple of things we really want to do. We would love to build something. We would love to code something up. And what was really fantastic is following the distribution or the delivery of these projects, we asked the kids what their level of enjoyment was, and we found that their level of enjoyment and their expectations matched exactly what they had hoped for. So we were able to say to, to say to those kids that wanted to build, wanted to create, wanted to learn the computer code, we were able to see that they were able to achieve exactly what they had hoped to. So that was also a very, very strong point of happiness for me. And then finally, the last thing I wanna emphasize is that we asked as a question in our post survey, uh, would you like to see uh, or participate in other Tinkerworks projects? Overwhelmingly, the response was yes, to the point that all of those that, were, uh, that had taken the survey, 82% of them said, uh, gave us the strongest rating in terms of the strongest desire levels to move forward. One person had said that it's okay moving forward, but all others had said that they absolutely would. So again, a strong point of happiness from my side, uh, given the, you know, the sample size we had. Um, so all in all, I'd say that I was personally quite pleased with the results. I'm always warm to hear the words through Alderman Hartburns uh, and others who talk about uh, being on the ground and seeing what the children were able to, uh, to create and the happiness that they saw. And I'll end my discussion here just by saying that uh, I, I hope we have the opportunity to move forward. And at this point, I'm personally happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Any questions yeah. from the Alderman? Alderman Garza. Mayor, um, like Shakira say, so we have very great program when we did it. Um, myself was 20 students, Shakira have another 20. Uh, they are so happy to learn a lot. But uh, because once a pilot program where we start, so we have so much uh, going on and really we don't have the experience. Like it was the first time. So myself, we have to have instructor in the class because I know because the pandemic or whatever, so mm -hmm. they have to do some classes. And for the little kids it was very difficult to do myself. I cannot leave the kids there in the, in the hall myself, you know? So they need to know, um, I, don't, I need to know if they, with the next future classes, they want to have an instructor in there because like a little kids, for my own experience, for the little ones, like a, a second grade, deal with the glue guns and all that, that's kind of um, a danger. So I, I think they need somebody watching these small kids. So this is my question. So they want to send an instructor or, or we have to pay again, like a world funds to pay the instructor. No, well, uh, Alderman Garza, we'll manage that with community services. The, uh, Simon Rodriguez has been actually assigned to this. So he's going to be facilitating us for the community services aspect. And, and that was mentioned during the finance committee, which uh, you weren't there for that. So we actually have that uh, managed internally. Okay, yeah, because they need a lot, uh, they need supplies first. They need to have the supplies. Second, they, they, they have to provide um, everything, you know, like us. Um, I believe uh, David have to buy a big screen TV. Myself, I have to buy a big screen to kids, the little kids understand exactly when there's a Zoom class in a show uh, saying, okay, this is the yellow, the yellow wire go with the red wire or whatever. The little kids, they don't know, they're confusing so much. So they need more, more space, like a big screen to see more clear and understand everything. So that's what I'm saying. So like for us, what's the first thing? There's a pilot program, so we learn a lot. But in, in the end, the kids are so happy. They learn a lot. And they are so happy to make the robots and all that. But um, was a learning experience for me, like a, an alderman. And I believe Shakira's too. But um, I hope now they facilitate more uh, with the new kids, is, is my question. 
Well, I mean, that's why community service is now involved. And as you mentioned, it was a prototype. We had to work out some bugs, right? It was during the middle of COVID, so we had to navigate it and adjust. But um, overall, as I think everyone can agree, the results actually proved themselves. But we will work out those peripheral things to make sure that we have more support and facilitation. And that's yes, why yes. time and, and community services will be involved. As well, yeah, because when you are with us in the Sierra Hall, you see two people there helping the little kids was enough with two. Because uh, yeah, to me it was very um, dangerous. Leave the kids with the glue gun and deal with the glue gun. To me was very, I'm afraid to that, you know? So that's why we need somebody watching these kids, what they're doing. Okay. Alderman Jenkins. Yes, I think from the standpoint of uh, overall being, this is the pilot and we learned, we learned a lot from it. But, you know, in terms of seeing the young people taking the opportunity to really delve into some areas that they had never delved into. And then as it was said, you know, a lot of them to get the, the motorized vehicle going and it's something they did. And then also to use the laptops uh, in terms of working with uh, Tinkerworks and, and some of the instructors. I mean, yep. it, it was really, I, we learned a lot I, and, and I observed a lot from them uh, in terms of the young people. And I think uh, they would look forward to us continuing this. So I'm glad we're doing this, uh, but also we can work with uh, local businesses who wanna come in and help because again, you know, this gives us the opportunity to get additional resources. And then also some use some of the companies that are here with their employees who would want to be involved and work with the kids. So again, we learned from this pilot now we can do better next year and the year after. On our burns. Mr. Mayor, it was a great pilot program. I'm, I feel honored that Mike had called and asked about it and then for all the guys to pull in. Yeah, there might be things that we had to do, but the biggest student was Sherman himself. That's why he's talking so good. He was able to see firsthand how to pull those little red and green and wire hey, together. Look, hey, look, and OK, with, I got mine. Mine was the fastest. <laughs> Mine was the fastest. I, it, made, it made it go the fastest. Well, it all. sounds like the alderman had just as much fun as the children. He so, did. So that's what we're saying. So that's so, why he can speak so good about it. He had just as much fun as the kids. The little he kids was fish there and joined it. All yes, right. Y'all are very enough. excited about it. So, so, so <laughs> we're excited yeah. that. We're so I'm going to assume this going consent. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. We got, we got a couple more questions. Alderman Yamas. Thank you, Mayor. I don't mean to bring down the mood, but looking at the, the demographic breakdown there, how do we only have 9% of the, of the participants as uh, Hispanic when Hispanics make up about 40 something percent of the city's population? That was because of the number that Alderman Garza was able to get in the program, in the pilot program. That was why. So did we not promote it more in the Hispanic community? It, we was using Alderman Garza connection, her mm -hmm. students that she had chosen. That's what happened. It was a pilot program. Now we, the money's been allocated that we can't do more programs. That's what it was all about. Trying to see if this program more time. Yeah, yeah, the school was time. actually 50, was 50 students all, it was 50 all students. Left mm -hmm. And then after that, you know, we would extend it out because this current phase, once it's approved by city council, will focus on 600 plus students throughout the entire city of Aurora. Right. And, and also, if Wait. I could also add that. Well, hold on, Sherman. I, hold on. But you'll, let me just finish here before so my baby's about to start crying. So <laughs> what I was saying is I, I want to make sure that when we do expand it, that we have equal opportunity for all our, our students across the city, and especially in underserved communities that include Hispanic communities. That was that wasn't an issue there at all. It's just that we knew that. But the pilot program was the number that all the guards was able to get during the pandemic. So you also have to remember was this was just right at the heart or start of the pandemic. So there were some points in there where we were yeah. kind of debating whether we were going to do it or do not. Do it at all, right. You know, so so we well, I, think what Alderman, I think Alderman Alderman is just saying, let's just make sure when we start this new program yeah. that we send it across the board, make the equality for everybody. I don't, I don't think that's- Absolutely. And I would like to just add, um, yeah. 
Very well noted. And one of the reasons that Simon is brought on board is to help with the broader outreach for the program to ensure that youth services connections with other serving, youth serving organizations, with the school districts and the schools that will be appropriate for recruitment will be part of that process. And we would use all of our methods that we typically use to get the word out. So it'd be your grassroots on the ground word um, sharing, but also maximizing social media campaigns as well to ensure that there's that equal opportunity to participate. Thank you. Alderman Mesiakos. Thank you, Mayor. I, I think Dr. Halloway answered most of my question. Uh, but primarily, if somebody's listening in on this right now, if, if a parent's listening and have participatory interest, where would they go once this is approved? Where could we send them to? Uh, get more information and see if their children qualify. That would be a role. I know we have ADS being a participant in this and delivery of the services, but that would be a role um, very much taken on by Simon Rodriguez. So contact okay. the Simon Rodriguez at Youth Services. Okay. He'll be able to put into put that person in contact and and determine eligibility as well. Thank you, Dr. Holloway. Thank you, Mayor Alderman Buck. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was looking to see if Simon was on the call because, uh, as mentioned, this was brought up at finance. I am. So is, is Simon on the call? Yeah. yeah. I'm Alderman Bug, yes, sir. Oh, there you are. Hello. Hello. <laughs> what we're talking about, you jump on in. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt anyone, but uh, thank you. Uh, and just to, to add to Dr. Holloway, yes, uh, we're currently working on our plan. So once everything's finalized, uh, when we're ready to roll out, the promotional aspect. Um, and I'm also working uh, directly with um, with um, Chris and our, uh, with the CDBG uh, funding to make sure we meet the qualifications. So once that's taken care of uh, very soon, uh, we're going to um, go ahead and roll out the promotional aspect of it. And as mentioned before with Dr. Holloway, we're going to work with our uh, partner organizations in the community that serve our youth and our school districts to make sure that we are reaching that broader demographic that Alderman Yamas and others have mentioned. Any other questions from the Alderman? Alderman Yamas. Alderman, Alderman Yamas and Alderman O'Connor. A quick follow up with, uh, with Simon and youth services. From what I understand, he wasn't involved in the initial uh, planning or the, the initial pilot program. So I think that we definitely need to utilize him and his role in the city to make sure that we do reach the, the uh, as many of our student residences as, as we can. I was like, that's the plan. Alderman O'Connor. Yes, I just wanted to comment a couple things. Um, first of all, we apparently have enough confidence that uh, Sherman knew how to use a glue gun so that didn't create any major problems. So that's good. The young, the young people uh, helped me very, very well. <laughs> oh, good. Secondly, um, I think, and the discussion in the uh, committee and also tonight in regard to a lot of the uh, things that went into this and the results of the, the uh, pilot program, uh, overall, we're very impressed with what this portends uh, in regard to a very good expansion now to 634 students in Aurora. Um, I say all of that even with having some concern that the results of the survey showed a diminishment in interest in social sciences, which goes to my heart because of the political science and history. But, you know, as I said in the committee, you can only make so many exciting things out of the Constitution, uh, or probably the election itself has diminished the interest in some young people in regard to uh, what they're going to see in social services. So, but I, I uh, social sciences, I think overall, uh, the committee was was impressed with the with the manner that this was going to proceed. I just wanted to confirm, uh, Dr. Holloway or or Mike, it is confirmed that uh, Housing and Urban Development has approved this now at this point. Yeah, Chris mentioned that at the last meeting. Chris is on um, the call as well. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, we've been working with. HUD all along here, and uh, this has always been an eligible activity. The question that we had was regarding, uh, and pardon my colleague here, as uh, Alderman Yamas I'm sure could relate, um, the issue that we had was exceeding what is called our public service cap. Uh, this project was originally slated as economic development, 
but the CARES Act allowed us to issue waivers to go beyond that 15% cap. So this is a project that is eligible. Um, I'm working with Simon on just capturing all of the uh, pre-application documents that we would normally do with our regular application. Um, and we're targeting a approval right before Thanksgiving based on the required public hearings, uh, public comment period, and uh, just going through the normal process through Fisk Committee of the Whole and eventually City Council. So you'll be seeing this again, um, but we'll include the, the normal documentation and hopefully have some more updates on how we're going to be doing our outreach. So my apologies to my colleague here. <laughs> there's there's no, apologies, <laughs> no apologies necessary. Zoom brings to the, the screen real life. And maybe you and Alderman Yamas ought to get together because you can share <laughs> responsibilities. So... Uh, Absolutely no, no apologies <laughs> needed. So, with, with, no, right. with no objection or no any further questions, um, Alderman, hold on, Alderman, Ms. Piggies. Yeah, and just one thing a follow up for Alderman uh, O'Connor had asked um, we need to make a revision on the invoice to take out the facilitation cost. I sent a message to Ratu, who is part of the Tinker Work staff, to separate that out and to send a separate invoice for the facilitation services for that. Four thousand nine hundred uh, dollars, and I'll right. make sure that's attached to the resolution going forward. And I'll All send right. it. Thank, over. thank you very much. No objections on consent. All right. Next item is twenty zero five seven eight resolution authorizing the purchase of one Zoll X series cardiac monitor defibrillator and accessories using the Silver Cross Purchasing Cooperative in the amount of twenty eight thousand seven hundred eighteen dollars and twenty two cents. From the Aurora Fire, uh, for the Consent. Aurora Fire. Uh, this is a continuation of our program of equipping uh, the engines with uh, the uh, monitor and the defibrillator. That's great. And um, this is paid for from the foreign fire tax. So this is not direct from the, the budget. So, Consent. No matter gone consent. Consent. Right. Thank you. 20-0599 is a resolution authorizing the execution of sales tax reimbursement agreement with Lindsay Windows, Illinois, LLC. And I think Consent. Mr. Debo is on the line. Um, if you want to add anything to uh, what you provide in the information? Um, I'm going to just uh, a quick one. And I think Alex Manella has got a couple of slides. Maybe Alex, you could uh, grab this. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so just real quick. Uh, no time is short. We're here, here to seek the approval of the sales tax reimbursement agreement between the city of Aurora and Lindsay Windows of Illinois. The agreement calls for 35% on behalf of the city, 65% Lindsay sharing of sales taxes up to $150,000 for Lindsay over five years. The location is what we often refer to as the old Cub Food site, vacant for many years at 55 South Constitution. The property is owned by St. Paul's Lutheran Church who is a not-for-profit, does not pay real estate taxes, and that will change under the new ownership. Uh, the owner was unanimously granted a special use for its window and replacement door manufacturing business in August. Uh, Lindsay is a family-owned, ethically-centered, common, community-based company. And I say this from personal experience, having financed the company and then moved to Illinois um, to North Aurora some six years ago. And the screen shows you the, you know, the national scope of this company. Uh, Jeff Royce, one of the owners of the company, is traveling today and cannot be with us. He was at the finance committee meeting where he spoke passionately of the company's hiring practices that included hiring people with STEM training and training them in today's highly technical production environment. This also followed the Tinker uh, discussion that we just had, and Jeff was very excited about that and brought forth examples of how they hired young people and trained them uh, in some uh, underserved areas and the success of what they do. So we really are excited about uh, having them here. Um, and really this whole thing is uh, a result of the big box um, committee uh, that was formed by the mayor and his task force uh, held, headed by Alex Alexandru um, to really deal with what to do and how to repurpose these uh, big boxes. We talked uh, a week or so ago about factor and them coming into the Cosmos site over there. Um, I just want to take an opportunity to thank uh, all my colleagues who've worked so hard for the last couple of years on this, uh, Alex Manella, uh, Trevor Dick, and Marima uh, Martinez in my office. Of course, our friends at Invest Aurora, 
and uh, the whole crew, John Curley at Sieben, uh, Tracy Vasek, and of course, Marty Lyons, who I work very closely with and work closely on this. Um, you know, thank you so much. And uh, I'm here for any questions that you might have. Questions from the Alderman? Can you do me a favor and close out of that, Mr. Manila, so I can make sure, so I can see everyone? Thank you, sir. Questions from consent. the Consent. With no questions, this item will go on consent. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is 200616, resolution authorizing execution of wage and insurance rollover agreement between the City of Aurora and Local 3298, Council 31, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFL-CIO for the uh, January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Consent. I believe Alicia Lewis is on the, uh, on the line. If you wanna just highlight, this is similar to what has happened in the past. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the city went into negotiations with uh, AFSCME 3298, which uh, mostly covers our administrative staff. Uh, the agreement with 3298 expired at the end of last year. And so we started negotiations, obviously going into 2020, pandemic hit. So the negotiations were put on hold. Uh, and obviously that's, that's still in play. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen for the rest of the year. So the parties did agree to a modest increase um, for the year to um, 2020 this year, which is a, excuse me, a one and a half increase. Um, our non-exempt and executive uh, groups, as well as some of the other groups, have also already had gotten an increase at the beginning of the year. And so this is um, something we agreed to, to you know, support our staff and some of the financial impact that may uh, have occurred with our employees and their family members. We will start, or the plan is to start negotiations back up in April of 2021. Consent. consent. No objection. Item will go on consent. Consent. Twenty zero six one seven. A resolution authorizing execution of a rollover agreement between the City of Aurora and Local One Five One Four Council Thirty One American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees AFL CIO. This is in the same uh, area here, and also done in the past. This is dealing specifically with the uh, Local Fifteen Fourteen. Consent. Consent. No objection, I'm the bone consent. 20 the public hearing regarding the creation of the proposed Fox Valley Mall Area Tax Increment Finance District. This is part of the procedure. A public hearing is required. Uh, it would be held on October 27th next week at the council meeting. So this would have to be put on unfinished. Unfinished. Right, item 20-0622, resolution authorizing the mayor to permit the city staff to apply for an Illinois transportation enhancement program or called ITEP grant for the Montgomery Road multi-use plan extension from Middlebury Drive to Illinois Route 59 to extend that plan from Middlebury to 59 and to reserve local funding share for both engineering and construction if the grant is awarded to the city. There is a plan for Consent. this. But we are working on getting the money uh, through this ITEP program. So. Consent. All right. The next item, uh, the next three items uh, came out of the discussion in the Finance Committee in regard to compensation. The first one, 20-0659 is the ordinance Chairman, setting the- Chairman, before you, before you start any of the conversation uh, concerning compensation, especially as it concerns the mayor, I'm gonna hand it over to you, uh, take over as mayor pro tem, and I will recuse myself from any conversations concerning that, as I don't want to give the impression that, you know, I support it and I could benefit it, benefit from them if for some reason I, get reelected, and if I don't, that I would um, cause the next individual not to uh, get fair compensation. So I will just, uh, I'm gonna turn off my camera and let you take over from, for the conversation for the uh, pay, okay? All right, fine. Thank you. Um, 20 is the ordinance setting the compensation of the alderman elected in and after 2021 in accordance with the Illinois Municipal Code and Local Government Officer Compensation Act. So this was a discussion in the committee. It, it related back to four years ago in regard to the discussion that was had at that time of over what was an appropriate and logical and reasonable uh, progress in regard to uh, compensation for aldermen. 
uh, that was pointed out by a member of the committee, some of whom served on the special committee four years ago, that uh, there was a, a desire at the time and still in mind among a number of the aldermen to continue trying to, uh, to make changes in regard to the alderman salary to keep it uh, current uh, and not fall terribly behind. And there was a, a, a bunch, a, a large amount of discussion in the committee about the fact uh, as to representative uh, of our salaries compared to other municipalities and also members of the county uh, boards uh, in our four counties that uh, we are in as the city of Aurora and felt that the a reasonable advance on these uh, salaries uh, is really what's appropriate at this point. So the recommendation from the committee was to provide for an increase in the uh, salary uh, beginning in 2023, because a uh, alderman sitting in office at this point cannot uh, vote on changing their salary. So we have six aldermen that that would apply if it uh, uh, took place in 2021. So it has to go to 2023, which is the system that we have had in place for many years. Uh, if you note it every time we change. So the uh, recommendation was to begin 2023 at a two, at a, sorry, a 3% increase uh, each sequence uh, and resulting in the last time it's done in a 5% increase uh, in order to keep these numbers moving forward at that point. So <clears throat> let any of the committee members who had the discussion in regard to that, if they wanna add anything to this at this point. Mayor Pro Tem, um, I do have some concerns over this uh, this ordinance, and I would ask this item to be put on unfinished. Okay. Any other questions or comments, uh, Alderman Lashi? Yeah, I, I also agree. I uh, I don't think that. Uh, I mean, it's too bad that we have to do this every four years. I don't know if there's any way around that. Maybe we can figure that out. But I'd say right now, with what's going on in the world, people are hurting. Uh, now it's not a good time to give ourselves a raise. I don't think uh, I don't think it's a good time, so I wouldn't be supporting this. That's all. All right, thank you, Alderman Vogue. Yeah, just for clarification in our discussions, and, and Alderman O'Connor uh, plainly stated, uh, at least for the Alderman, this uh, these numbers are for 2023. So we there was a lot of uh, response and reply. Uh, that these numbers would be enacted now or in the near future. And, and that's just not the case. These numbers are for three years from now. That's when they begin. So uh, I know we're all praying that uh, COVID is away in our rear view mirror by the time uh, 2023 rolls around. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's triple those prayers, <laughs> Alderman Buck. So, all right, any other questions or discussion? This will be placed on unfinished then. The next item is 200661, ordinance settling the compensation of the mayor to be elected in 2021 in accordance with the Illinois Admits Code and the Local Government Officer Compensation Act. The committee discussed this also on the basis of trying to stay uh, in some consistency with regard to the salary of the mayor. Uh, again, discussed four years ago as to what was appropriate to try to keep this moving forward. If you compare the salary of the city of Aurora, uh, second largest city and considering a $350 million budget and a, a billion dollar potential capital situation over the years, um, we are less or uh, at the same rate as uh, many of the municipalities and, and simply uh, behind in many other categories. So the discussion again in regard to trying, trying to stay on course here and not fall behind greatly was to go ahead and make the recommendation for the increase of the salary beginning in 2021. This one is not fixed on the fact that some aldermen uh, would obviously be voting on their own salary. Uh, beginning in 2021, at a two and a half percent increase per each of the first three years and a 5% increase in the final year. Again, on the rationale, a little bit uh, taking up from what Alderman Bug said that we hope by 2025 uh, that life will become a lot more stable in regard to this. So that again, we do not 
fall greatly behind in regard to a compensation situation. Uh, I assume this will be placed on unfinished. Uh, obviously, it'll give everybody the opportunity to uh, uh, speak on this. Uh, are there any questions or items to discuss on this from the committee, from the council itself? Alderman Franco. Yeah, I'd just like to say, as we hashed this out at the finance committee, we looked at comparisons. And I think we made the one comparison that um, there are a number of towns that are smaller than us population wise, where they have a city manager making in the range of $200,000 plus that does the job of our mayor. In addition, they have what they call a weak mayor, more of a ceremonial person that in the range of 25 to 30,000. So the compensation for those two that do the job of our mayor is about 230, $240,000. So our mayor making $158,000 doing that job, obviously for comparison sakes, fairly underpaid. So this is kind of, this was personally my rationale for promoting this that, you know, if we want to have fair compensation, attract the best individuals, I think we need to keep up rel relatively close with these other um, towns, municipalities that are doing this. So that was what, what I was looking at when we were doing this, because, you know, you want to compare apples to apples. And if we do that, we are way above for um, the amount of people we have, but yet our mayor is, is way underpaid compared to it. So that, that's what I was looking at. This is why I was in, in support of this because we certainly are behind. This proposal won't get the, the mayor to that spot, but at least it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a move in the right direction to try to get him a little bit closer to what the compensation should be for the work that he performs. Okay. Any other, uh, Alderman Lashby? Yeah, I, uh, I looked at your uh, chart that the Finance Committee studied on their special meeting on October 8th, and I see that the uh, uh, other two full-time mayors in uh, Rockford and Springfield make about 20% less. So I, don't, I think that our mayor is adequately paid, and I think that I don't agree with, although I, I appreciate Alderman Frankel's argument, we have a chief management officer and a CFO. So I don't know that you can add together a village managers or, you know, that a village manager, I don't know the argument makes sense. So anyway, I just, I don't support the increase for the same reasons I said before is the timing is uh, there's too many people that, that are hurting. So that's all. All right, thank you. Any other questions or discussion? All that this will be placed on unfinished. Unfinished. The last item is 20662, an ordinance amending sections 2 38, 2 59, and 2 60 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Aurora. I'm going to ask Mr. Veenster to come in on this discussion. This was, um, we initially approached this and everything in one ordinance, but it made sense to break apart, obviously, decision making in regard to the mayor and to the uh, alderman, but also we needed to do a little bit of, uh, as I think Mr. Veenster will refer to, uh, not legally, but a little cleanup and a little bit of, of clarification in regard to language. So, Mr. Veenstra, if you'd explain uh, this one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, members of the committee, what we're looking at doing with this is ordinarily what's contained in the city code are reflections of ordinances or expressions of the city council, things which are more of a permanent nature. Um, as Alderman Lofty noted, uh, the setting the salary schedules for the elected officials is something that we do uh, relatively frequently every the commencement of every, prior to the commencement of every term 180 days out we look at doing this and we reflect those changes in the code um, our suggestion would be removing those from the city code but contain continuing to codify them in the or continuing to maintain them in the ordinances as we, as we propose this time so that every time that there's a change in the salary it didn't require adjusting the city code and potentially engaging the codifier to make those changes um, there's certainly nothing wrong with um, doing it the way we're doing it. There's nothing incorrect about doing it the way that we propose. Uh, for transparency purposes, we could just as easily maintain a copy of the ordinances that reflect the salary schedule and have them very easily accessible to the public. Um, in the age of the internet, that's very easy to do. So that was one of the changes that we suggested. The other change that we suggested was taking a look at uh, how compensation is defined. Historically, compensation was viewed as being salary. What was exactly what was paid to somebody for the work that they perform on behalf of the city. Um, over the last 30 years, that concept has kind of expanded and compensation effectively now includes things like employee benefits um, and health insurance and pension benefits. 
So without changing any of those which have um, been available to and previously authorized by the city council for the elected officials, uh, categorizing those more appropriately, moving the sections uh, dealing with health insurance uh, to the compensation, compensation sections where they really belong and leaving things like reimbursement for normal business expenses in a separate section uh, where we would identify it uh, separately. And being reimbursed for um, an educational meeting is not compensation. That's something that you'd be expense incurred in the performance of your duties and responsibilities. Um, receiving keys to the office is not a fringe benefit. It's part of what you need to do to do your job and it's not compensatory. So cleaning up those two sections, uh, 59 and 60 and moving um, the provisions regarding insurance and pension from 60 into 59 seem to make a lot more sense. Mr. Veenstra, is this also the one that included the change in the recommended change in the per diem? Uh, that was included in the salary in in the compensation resolution for the all okay. so that is right I thought maybe that that moved I, over I, I think that's 659 at where it's currently yeah. let me let me clarify that for the uh, council's uh, benefit here the also the recommendation from the committee uh, to change the per diem which has been I think the same if Alderman Seville remembers to uh, 2002 when we initiated that the recommendation is to move the per diem from the amount of $75 to $90. So, um, but that uh, inclusion is under the, uh, under the recommendation that's on unfinished in all, any, any event. So obviously you have an opportunity to discuss if there's a concern about that too. So, all right, um, is Alderman Nemesiakos. Uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem, thank you. Uh, I just had a question in regards to if we're changing some of the language, uh, what, what's the definition? How, how do we define what time to time is? Who's going to trigger uh, the, the policy decision to look at this and moving into well, the, the establishment of, of well, the establishment and the, the way the statutory term is used, the fixing of salaries is determined by the corporate authorities, which is the city council. So the city council determines when it wishes to revisit um, any of the compensation upon its elected officials. However, any of the changes it makes cannot become effective during the current term of office and also need to be established 180 days prior to the commencement of the next term of office. Okay. So while some people will occasionally incorrectly describe a legislative body as increasing its own compensation or decreasing its compensation, its own compensation, that never really happens. What it's doing is it's setting the compensation for the next officers who the public will elect to hold those positions. Okay, so a little bit more deeper into my question. Would it be, would it be brought up by human resources to the chief of the alderman's office or does the chief of the alderman's office uh, start the process or is it the responsibility of the chairman of the RAP committee to bring it up moving into the future? There's no set responsibility. Any all, any member of the council or the mayor's office could initiate the, the process. Okay. Let me, let me it's add. It's a legislative that. initiative like any other. I think the discussion, if my committee members will confirm, I think the discussion in the committee was the fact that this really ought to be kept on a docket somewhere. Uh, and that probably now, most uh, likely would come through the RAP committee for it to be looked at in the future or at a time when, when they it felt it was appropriate. Is that correct, Alderman Franco, that we discussed that? Yeah, I'm sorry, Alderman Kai, would you please repeat that? I, just, I, I said we had the discussion about when would it appropriate, uh, obviously, to, to reconsider this. And I think the discussion was that it stays on the docket somewhere so that we have it in the future so that it just doesn't pop up all of a sudden that we have to, to look at it at this point, so. Right, some type of a trigger reminds us because we missed our point earlier this year. Um, so going forward to have some kind of a trigger via the docket to let us know, okay, the time has come again to revisit that. Yes, that's what we had talked about. So we don't, and as Alderman Messiaco said, who's responsible? Well, if we have it like that, then we know that it comes up. If we, whether we have a special compensation committee or a finance, we know that it needs to be addressed by whatever particular committee is working on at that time. This, this year was finance. So, so we're keeping that same trigger point then that we have, I think, what is it, August or July? When is that trigger point typically right now, as, as we know? The, um, the proposal does not include a trigger point encoded in the ordinance. And, and I would recommend against having a codified, anything that would be 
perceived as being a deadline or a cutoff date. The cutoff date that the council has is 180 days prior to commencement of the term. Now, if we internally decide that these compensation decisions should be made year and a half ahead of time, for example, in the summer of you know, two summers preceding an election, you know, that could be something that we develop internally and we set that uh, on a calendar to do it that way. I wouldn't, however, put it into the city code. Um, sometimes that can lead to the perception that the city is imposing its own deadline and a restriction on the city council's ability to set the compensation in a manner authorized by statute. But previously it was brought to us by the Chamber of Commerce. Remember that, Bob? Mm -hmm. It was brought to us by the Chamber of Commerce and then it ended up on government operation. So it was done on the four year period. That's how it was done. So however you want to change it, whatever you want to do, that's how it was done previously. And then we would have a meeting, um, a special meeting with the government operation committee uh, to deal with that issue. So that's how it's been done in the past. But whatever y'all want to do, I'm listening. So well, are we are we not going to be utilizing the Chamber of, Ch of Commerce any moving forward? Or did we use the chamber on this one, on these two items or three items? We, that we was, that was years ago. Yeah, we did not because of the time crunch, as I described it. Really, the only the only reason was having a separate body look at things was just to gather all of the information. Mm -hmm. uh, they did on occasion make some we recommendations, did. but as mm -hmm. I made the comment initially to the finance committee, this was brought up. Unfortunately, it's in our hands. We're going to make the final decision anyway. So I think at this point, we can certainly in the future, or the council in the future can go out and have an independent body do a lot of the research, whether it's the chamber or whoever it may be, League of Women Voters can do all the research. And if the council wanted to even say, fine, give us a recommendation, that'd be all right too. But eventually it's gonna come back into one committee or the other, this time it's in finance and in the, in the future, as I say, it might be more appropriately discussed initially in the, in the RAP committee. Uh, with some coordination with the finance committee. But, um, you know, and I don't think that there's going to be any uh, proposals probably coming forward in the next two or four years. Uh, you know, we're trying to set this at this point um, so that it would be a case of just making sure that we have a system that tells us in the summer of 2024 or whenever it is, got to look at this again and got to bring it up and, and make the decision as to how do we want to best approach it at that point. So. So with, with this, just one more question, if, you, if, if I may. So if we pass this ordinance uh, the way it's written uh, next week, w in essence, we can also bring it up next year or in 2022 as well, if we wish We to. could, except that it still wouldn't be applicable for another two years down the road, because again, right. an alderman sitting in office can't make a, uh, a vote on changing their salary. So you'd have to still push it off. If you wanted to look at it again, uh, and change it again, you'd have to look in the future. And to add to that, I mean, looking at what is on the books right now with respect to the aldermanic salaries, the scheduled adjustment of the aldermanic salaries is scheduled for 2022 at this point. But the problem with doing it that way, if the goal is to, or the problem or the result of doing it that way, if the goal of the council is to keep the aldermanic salaries consistent, it would mean that the salaries would be frozen during the, um, in 23 and 24, and the earliest any adjustment in salaries that would affect all the aldermen would not occur until 2025. So that the deadline that was proposed or included or the, the target date that was included in the uh, ordinance doesn't really, I think, accomplish what I'm sure the committee's goals were at that point to be able to adjust the compensation at the same time to affect all the aldermen at the same time in the same way. I, th I think that's well stated, Mr. Veenstra. Mr. Franco? So I guess what we're looking for here is a mechanism to make sure that when it's appropriate to address it, the two years in advance, that we have that in place so that we do get it 180 days prior to it coming through. So I, I would suggest that that question be answered between the aldermen and staff working together, because we do have a little time obviously going forward, we have a couple of years, to figure out the best mechanism to go forward to make sure that we're on it when we need to. Getting on it early is okay, but we certainly don't wanna get it on it late. So we gotta stay within the 180 day parameter if we wanna continue going forward and not have that hole 
that Mr. Vinci mentioned about not having salaries increase for X amount of years. So that would yeah. be my suggestion going forward. All right. Then we'll, uh, do you wish to put this, this particular ordinance with the uh, adjustments on unfinished or consent? I would, I, would, I would say consent. I don't think this is controversial in and of itself in there. It's just how we're going to get the mechanism going forward. Obviously, we've, we've done this in the past, but maybe we need more of a, a better um, vehicle to do that. It's more consistent. Mr. Chair. Uh, well, yes. Consent. Thank consent. you, Mr. Chair. Um, to answer Alderman Masiakos and comment on Alderman Franco's point, uh, we did have the mechanism in place this time. Uh, the chief of staff uh, during the early summer uh, brought this up, uh, brought it to different bodies. Uh, and of course, once again, um, you know, we were dealing with other things. We were dealing with the CARES Act money and other things and uh, it got behind and it, it slipped by. Once again, when we take this up in two to three to four years, prayerfully, we will not be in the midst of a pandemic and it will just, our chief of staff will do what they normally do. It'll come up and it'll flow either to RAP committee or finance committee. Okay. All right, we'll leave it. We'll put it on consent. If somebody obviously has a concern next week, obviously it can come off. So, and Mr. Um, Chairman, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm Mr. sorry, Chair, Mr. Bainstrom. Uh, on this matter, I noticed that the Legistar number in the uh, attachment is incorrect and doesn't correspond to the Legistar number. That's part of the part of the reason was we started this process earlier on and we've now changed the Legistar numbers a couple times. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I will make a change to that attachment um, before the time it gets to consent on um, on Tuesday, although it's only going to be as to the Legistar number. Um, one other comment to Alderman Bug's point, um, and I think also to Alderman Messiakos is the only thing thing that we're constrained by in terms of deadlines and statutory and constitutional restrictions is the changing of the compensation for the elected officials. If after this is done, we want to develop a process by which the compensation is reviewed and proposed adjustments are then brought to the council, that's something we can do at that point. There's no reason we can't establish a structure at some point in the future that governs how the council does what it's doing right now in establishing and fixing the salaries. That we can do at any point. The only thing that we can't do is change the compensation midterm or within 180 days of an election or the start of the new term rather. All right. Okay. That's something to be to be pursued at that point. So all right, Mr. Mayor, if you're on the line and can hear me. Yes, sir. Okay, we are done with those issues. I will say two things in regard to them. Number one, I appreciate the, the council discussion. They voted to increase the mayor pro tem salary by 200% for the next year. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and since it starts at zero, it's going to be zero. So we're fine. <laughs> we're all right. And, and secondly, I can tell you that this kind of discussion on this kind of topic I've seen more color put into my face than I've had. I've been pretty white looking. So now, now there's a little red there. <laughs> and I don't even, I don't even have to, to argue too much one way or the other. So it's not going to affect me. So back to you, back to you, Mr. Mayor. That's all the finance committee had. Thank you, kind sir. Chairman Hardburns, can you give the Public Health, Safety, and Transportation Committee report, please? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Public Health and Safety and Transportation Committee met on Tuesday, October the 13th, and we had one item. And item is 200628, and it's a resolution establishing the maximum number of Class B on site consumption license, unofficially related to the application from NH3 Enterprise Inc., Pantello, Garo, and Beef to be located at 1515 Butterfield Road in Aurora. Can That's going consent. <laughs> All right. And that concludes public health and safety and transportation, Mr. Mayor. Thank you much. Yeah. Chairman Garza, can you give the uh, Infrastructure and Technology Committee uh, report, please? Yes. Um, INT we get together on Monday, October 12th, and the only item we have is a 20 or 621, a resolution accepting the improvements in waiving the main and security for quality tool ink parking lot improvements on 727. Consent. Consent. That's all we have, Mayor. Only all right. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Franco, can you view the rules um, administration procedure committee report, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I just have a couple updates. Uh, we had a special RAP committee meeting last week to address uh, the hiring of the chief of staff position in the Alderman's office. Uh, and at that meeting, uh, we had a recommendation made for the chief of staff position. Uh, the process for hiring that person has been started. And our goal was to have this all completed by early next week. Uh, so we have an official announcement shortly thereafter. But as things have changed today somewhat that with a potential hiring freeze that the whole process is put on hold. But as soon as we get to go ahead, we will continue the process. We're right, we're right in the middle of it right now. So that's where we're at with that. Um, and then the other thing that we were talking about is at the last meeting, um, re residency for uh, public safety officials. So we had met a number of times um, with various people from the community, the, the police unions, attorney John Murphy, um, about the process, about the pros and cons of, of requiring that, utilizing it for negotiation. So um, right now, we are in the process of preparing a memo to submit to the mayor's office with a recommendation from the committee and how to address the, the issue based on those people and their recommendations on this topic. And we should have a final version of our recommendation ready to go at the next wrap meeting. So that'll be in about two weeks. We'll have that recommendation submitted to the mayor's office. Um, that's all I have from the wrap committee. Thank you, kind sir. That concludes the committee reports. Um, Go on to the uh, mayor or the mayor's report before we do the alderman's corner, which will be uh, which will be Alderman Mike Seville today. All right. Um, you know, first of all, I, I'm sure as Alderman Franco just pointed out, the uh, the news that we have heard that uh, a number of our counties have uh, have been forced to uh, participate in, in mitigations for COVID-19, meaning. We were in uh, phase four. Now we're, you know, kind of stepping back toward toward phase three, and that covers our counties of DuPage, Kane, and Will. You know, all in all in one day. So these mitigation uh, requirements will take place this Friday. Um, and as you see uh, right in front of us, the mitigation uh, requirements uh, state that all bars have to be closed. Uh, at 11 p.m. and may reopen no earlier than 6 a.m. the following day. However, there will be no indoor service, no indoor service. And we're just talking about bars for now. So that means if a bar cannot offer outdoor seating uh, that complies with the governor's orders, that bar will be closed. All bar patrons should be seated at tables outside. No ordering, seating, or congregating at the bar. Uh, bar stools should be removed. Table should be six feet apart. No standing, congregating indoors and outdoors while waiting for a table or, 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 um, or exiting. No dancing or standing indoors. Reservations required for, for each party. Again, this is only for outdoor service. Uh, no seating of multiple parties at one table for this outdoor service. Now for restaurants. All restaurants close at 11 p.m. and may open no earlier than 6 a.m. the following day. However, that will be no indoor service. I'll say this again for restaurants, that each restaurant must have outdoor seating that complies with the government, governor's orders uh, and our health department. And uh, tables should be six feet apart, no standing or congregating indoors or outdoors while waiting for a table or uh, exiting the restaurant. Reservations required for each party, no seating of multiple parties at one table again. And that's only for outdoor. There will be no indoor service for restaurants. Um, now, as far as social meetings, because we understand by watching the news and hearing our, our health departments, medical officials talking, that the bars and restaurants may not necessarily be the reason why, or may not have to be the only uh, reason why our positivity rate is increasing in all of our major counties in Aurora. It may be because of some of the social gatherings that we have, birthday parties, um, house parties, any weddings, funerals. Now, because of the new mitigation requirements, we're gonna, it has to go back to the limit of less of 25 people or 25% of the overall room capacity. So no more than 25 people, but it could be less than that um, uh, if the overall, only, if it's only 25% of the overall room capacity, both indoor 
and outdoor. No party buses, gaming, and casinos will close at 11 p.m. and are limited to only 25% capacity and follow mitigations for bars and restaurants, if applicable. That means if they have um, areas where there's a bar or where there is a restaurant inside the, inside the, uh, the gaming facility, that the bars and restaurants requirements are applied the same uh, to the casino. So there will be no indoor eating or, or drinking at the bar while at the casino. Organized groups, recreational activities, that hasn't changed. All sports guidance effective August 15, 2020 remain in effect. Outdoor activities not included in the above exposure, exposure settings continue per the current DCEO guidance. Now, uh, you know, I, I, I think we all recognize that we never wanted to, you know, ever come to this point. And uh, one of our counties had already experienced this previously, Will County. As a matter of fact, I spoke to Alderman Bug about, about it earlier when, you know, Will County had its mitigation requirements and was required to shut down. Now they're back in that same position. What we don't want to happen is that our three major counties all be in this position at the exact same time or be in this position at all. You know, so we've got to do our part to continue to spread the word and make sure that people are doing what's necessary to ensure that our positivity rate does not increase past 8%. Matter of fact, that it continues to decrease because it, can you believe that it was at, you know, not much more than 3% at one point? Now we're back over, over 8%. So that means we're not following, you know, all of us are not doing what we need to do to follow the rules. So we as elected officials, aldermen, the mayor, everyone we know have to make sure that people are, are doing what they need to do we're never going to get past this unless we all work together to get past it. You know, while we wait for a, um, uh, a vaccine or some type of mitigating treatment that uh, will help with COVID-19, we've got to do what's necessary to protect our community uh, and our most vulnerable. So you guys, let's all, let's all do what we got to do to get the word out. This Thursday, I'll have a press conference uh, at 1.15 talking about some of the things that we need to do today. I, uh, I had a, a media briefing uh, with Channel 7, just talking about some of some of the things that, that we're going to be needing to do and, and talk about, you know, and have hard conversations. I look, I, I, I'll tell you what I told the reporter. I know we're, we're all experienced COVID fatigue. We're tired of talking about it, tired of hearing about it. But the reality is until we get a vaccine, this is our reality. This is our new norm. And to make sure that we don't have to take these steps backwards, you know, to do these mitigating requirements, we've got to continually push forward and make sure that our people, all of our, our residents and our community are following these simple rules, you know, consistently washing our hands and using hand sanitizer, uh, staying six feet apart from each other, even family members at gatherings inside of your family homes, you know, making sure that when we do go out in public that we wear, wear masks and wear masks wherever we talk to someone that, that we don't live in the same household same household with simple things that we do to ensure that, you know, and, and, and it, I know it sounds simple. And I, and, and again, I know we have cold fatigue and this is, you know, a hindrance and we're tired of dealing with it, but we got to do this if we don't want to end up back in the situation where we're all inside the house, twiddling our thumbs, wondering when we're going to be able to get out and live normal lives. You know, I think this is a uh, small things for us to do, wear a mask, wash our hands, social distance for us to, you know, be as normal as possible. So, uh, you know, again, to, on Thursday, I'll have a press conference talking about, I invite all the aldermen there. And, you know, what I'll ask is not only is this something that I say, it's something that the aldermen spread and they're each individual wards and the aldermen large around the city to make sure that everybody's complying. Now we, we, we work, we've been working hard here in Aurora and, and even, you know, Aurora being in a, a unique position, being in four different counties, Kane, Kendall, um, Will and DuPage, we, we see that, you know, that it's not always up to us. There's a lot of cities in Kane County, a lot of cities in DuPage, a lot of cities in Will, but we at least need to do our part to drive the positivity down. So maybe if we do our part even more so than the other cities and other communities, maybe we'll affect the, the rate positively. So all we can do is, is what we can do for the city of Aurora. And we've been doing a great job, but we've, I think we've got to do, we got to do a little bit more. We got to work a little bit more vigilantly a little harder to make sure that, that, you know, we don't take steps backwards because it hurts us. It hurts our businesses. It hurts our residents. It hurts our employees of those businesses. 
you know, I've, I've talked to, you know, restaurant owners that say that if they shut down again, which they're going to be forced to, that, you know, they may just think about staying, staying closed the whole winter and coming back in the spring, maybe after we get a vaccine or some of them not opening at all. We can't have that. So let's just do our part to make sure that we can protect, you know, our own, protect our businesses, protect our, our, our community, protect the city of Aurora. Does anybody got any questions on that before I go to the next issue? Alderman Franco. Well, I, I don't know. Is the next issue going to be how it affects us financially, budget-wise? or No. Okay, we'll so talk, I guess that would be my... talk about that another day. Okay, so we're not going to get into that tonight? No, not, no, not tonight. Okay, okay. all right. Because that's a whole other discussion. Uh, let's another, we could spend another two hours on that discussion, discussion alone. Okay. Um, but it is one that we're having, you know, um, uh, uh, having close conversations with our CFO uh, and his team to see, you know, how this will affect us in the long run. Mr. Mayor? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Alderman Buck. Yes. Can you tell us how this impacts, if any, uh, places of worship? Well, that would be under, it did, I don't know, they've um, separated place of worship, sep, you know, in its own category, but that would be social gatherings, I would, I would, I would assume, you know, um, with uh, 25 people or less, or 25% of a room. However, what it was not, a social gatherings were not identified by themselves individually when we had the conversation with the governor's office today. Any other Thank questions? You. I, I can't see anybody's hands being raised. So if you just speak up, if there are any other questions. All right, well, I'll just, I'll just, you know, conclude on this particular issue and say this, look, we just got to do our part of war, you know, and I'll even speak to our community that's listening. We've got to do our part, but even though we've been going through all this, you know, this since, since March, Aurora is still open for business. Aurora is open for business, you know, and, and, and what do I mean by that? In spite of the pandemic, Aurora still, been doing what we need to do to make sure that our businesses thrive and continue to open. You know, um, matter of fact, uh, we've, we've had more than a dozen ribbon cuttings already this fall. Um, Bella Viva Nail Bar, that's a minority woman owned, millennial owned business um, that, that was open right here in the city. You know, Glam Beauty Supply, another minority women owned business. That's uh, Alderman Sherman Jenkins wearing his shorts there. Y'all see that? <laughs> it was hot outside. It was hot. <laughs> APS Training Institute, another minority owned business right here in the city of Aurora. Scientel Solutions, a global headquarters relocation, global, international city, open international business open right here in the city of Aurora. Day Dance Fuse Nutrition, another minority woman-owned business right here in the city of Aurora. Surfs Up Aurora, delicious seafood restaurant, minority-owned right here in the city of Aurora. Patelli's Restaurant, hamburgers, hot dogs, and delicious fries, minority-owned business, open right here in the city of Aurora. The Fox Valley Mall Treehouse, a multi-million dollar investment by our friends at the Fox Valley Mall at Centennial open this year right here in the city of Aurora during the pandemic. Restore Aurora on the far west side, you know, right next, right next to uh, Old Cosmopolitan um, opening right here, you know, in the city of Aurora. Monday Music Garden, partnership with Aurora Downtown. We still are, are, are trying to make sure our, our, our open spaces are beautiful and accessible. And we open that right here in Aurora downtown. Ta uh, talented 10th Social Services, a minority woman-owned business right here in the city of Aurora. Zen Leaf Aurora that just had its ribbon cutting today. 38 employees, $1 million in tax revenue to the city of Aurora open right here. And there's even more to come next week. So, you know, even though we've been going through some hard times and I'm not, 2020 has not been a good year for any of us and throughout this whole country, you know, and, you know, throughout our state and through, you know, throughout our city, but we working together, we've made a difference. We've shown people that even though this, this pandemic is going on, this, this, this plague that has affected the whole world, that Aurora is still standing and still ready to go forward, you know, and do what we need to do to open businesses 
here in our community. We've seen that, we'll continue to see it, and we'll come you know, out of this in 2021 even stronger because we're setting the foundation, preparing ourselves for the success of the future. This pandemic ain't COVID-19 will not last forever. It won't. There's going to be a vaccine. Everybody's going to take it at some, you know, at some point, and we will be poised, poised and prepared to be ready to grow and to blow this city up. You know, we, we were doing well before the pandemic. We were doing great before the pandemic, and we'll be doing amazing, you know, after it. And we know that because while it's been going on, we've still been doing great. And I want to thank all, you know, all the aldermen in every ward and our aldermen at large, you know, throughout the city that work throughout the city for everything that you guys have done in your wards to make sure that we've continued to move forward. You know, with, without you guys, without, without you 12, you know, supporting and making sure that, you know, you hold a roar on your shoulders, we wouldn't be in the strong position we're in today, but we are in a strong position. We're in a strong position to finish this year strong, even though we're taking a few steps back with the mitigation uh, requirements that have been imposed um, by the, by the state, by the governor's office. But, you know, you, you can, you can hit us. You can, you, you can knock us down a, few, a little, if you know, a few rungs, but you're not going to hold us down and the roar is going to always stand strong and, and always rise to the top. So we'll be okay. You know, these are just a, a setback that we'll, we'll work through and um, we'll do it together. And we'll, I'm going to ask all of you to ask all of your residents and all of your wards and throughout the city to stand with us. So when we, when this is over, we all stand strong. Any questions about what I said? Alderman Franco. No, I just have one comment. I, this is for Alderman Jenkins. I want to know how he missed the Monday ribbon cutting ceremony because he was in every other picture. So how did that happen? <laughs> I was there. It's, I just didn't get in that picture. That's all okay, I was. Okay. I was Thank there. you. I thought, that, I thought you might have been ill. He, he, he didn't move fast enough, man. <laughs> he didn't have his shorts. His long pants caught his, caught his shoes up. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right, well, then let's go on to the, the part of the, uh, the agenda that we've all been looking for, looking forward to. Alderman Mike Seville, why don't you give us what's, what's going on in the sixth ward, man? Uh, okay. Alderman's corner. Tell us Thank you, Mayor. Here. Well, it's been a while since we've heard from the sixth ward in our, our corner, so I'm going to uh, try to give you up to uh, date uh, what's been going on. Uh, I uh, would like to begin by the pedestrian river uh, bridge uh, to connect both the first and the sixth wards. Uh, it had been scheduled to open up in 2020, but there was a COVID-19 railing issue delay, and it's looking like it's going to open uh, in 2021 this spring. So we're all looking forward to that. That's going to be great. Uh, my constituents are looking forward to walking across uh, the river and using the public transportation center, as well as the um, our beautiful uh, concert uh, park as well. So. Um, Charlie's Creamery is moving forward with their second phase, which is the wine bar in the basement that's currently uh, proceeding. Uh, the Keystone Building is on Stope to be uh, rehabbed and redeveloped. Uh, the Hobbs Building is moving forward after, after a little bit of a delay because of the COVID-19 uh, financing issues, uh, but they are moving forward and there will be a total of 31 rental units on the upper floors. Uh, draft Urban, which is locating in the formerly Oswald's Photoshop on Stope, uh, combining with the vacant corner lot for outdoor seating is moving forward. Uh, that building has been vacant for quite some time. And we all know that the former school district building is proceeding. Uh, in fact, um, all the units above uh, have been, uh, the rentals have been leased up. Uh, other economic development uh, in my ward, as you know, El Jefe is opened up on Lake Street. Uh, McDonald's um, had some issues. They built a new building. There was a fire. They had to demolish it. Uh, they worked with the city to get a new site plan. Uh, and the end result is probably the, one of the best looking McDonald's in the city um, with increased setbacks, landscaping, and we're going to have a pedestrian link uh, from Lake Street uh, to the bike trail down there by the river. Uh, the former bleachery uh, down below Lake Street uh, is being turned into what is called the Keelings. Foundation uh, Veterans Training and Job Placement Center and the Coffee Place uh, and Retail Center the City Council approved earlier uh, in the year is moving forward. There is some delaying on that. Uh, that was the former Long John Silvers on Lake Street next to White Castle. Uh, other issues and improvements in the Sixth Ward since the last Alderman's Corner. Uh, the Sixth Ward has been instrumental in funding the summer camp 
programs every year at Randall and West Monomoy. We had to pause that, of course, because of the pand pandemic, but we're looking to resume that in 2021, as well as the Khan Academy, the after school learning uh, in partnership with at risk mentoring and David Smith. Uh, recently, the Sixth Ward gave a, a grant to the at risk mentoring for the Mobile Tech Center. Uh, to help with educating and using technology uh, to help our youth. Uh, very excited about that. Uh, we did have partnership with the library and sending the bookmobiles to Black Park Park, Randall West, Montemore area, and Arrowwood Park. But again, we had to pause that and hope to resume that again because of the pandemic in 2021. And Marie Wilkinson Garden and Marie Wilkinson Food Pantry, I'm very proud of. Um, the food pantry is now, after a successful five years, expanding their garden. Uh, they currently have a new lease that's been drafted by our uh, legal department uh, for another five years with an expansion, uh, not quite doubling in space. Uh, this area would be south of their current garden uh, and north of the current well station uh, near the uh, corner of New Haven and Highland Avenue. Uh, this will open up new land for planting for the 21 season, as I mentioned. And I just want to mention that uh, prior to this year, the largest amount of harvest of vegetables that the garden uh, produced was just a thousand pounds. Well, they not only doubled it this year, they tripled it. Uh, they're harvesting as of this morning, 3,257 pounds of food that's going to their clientele that come to their food pantry, uh, which I think is very, very significant. Um, also the pantry has installed in our uh, garden uh, and Judd Lofty, Judd, Judd Lofty knows about the garden because he's planted a plot there with Suzanne. Uh, and um, they've installed solar panels. Uh, they're hosting garden events like luncheons, meetings, religious studies, uh, and educational events. So it's really a wonderful opportunity to learn about gardening for the community uh, and also to see the good work that the volunteers are doing. They're doing a great job. And in fact, this Sunday, they're hosting uh, a fall festival and giving away pumpkins to people. So uh, kudos to all, all they're doing out there. Uh, as we know, I, last summer in 2019, the Palace Park was dedicated in conjunction with the Box Valley Park District. I'm still getting positive feedback from people. It's been very successful. Green space for that part of my ward. Uh, unfortunately, the Ira Park development had to be, laid, de 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 be delayed because of the COVID-19, uh, and we hope to get that on track um, for next year. The, um, there was a neighborhood planning initiative plan for Monomoy and Randall area, and the, uh, the townhomes and the condos, uh, Ivy Glen, um, Autumnwood Apartments, Victory Court and the like. Uh, but unfortunately, once again, because of the pandemic, we've had to uh, uh, delay that and put it on hold, but we hope to have that uh, ready to go for uh, next year. Uh, and because of the pandemic, we did uh, originally schedule a junk and trash drop off pickup uh, program, uh, but uh, it was thought that maybe we should do another alternative type program. So uh, the ward sponsored a junk and trash sticker program for the sixth ward. And ham I'm happy to announce that we had a record turnout, uh, 1,016 people in my ward requesting garbage stickers for a total of 3,048 trash stickers that we have um, uh, mailed out to my constituents. So I like to say that we're functioning the sixth ward this summer uh, and this fall. So very exciting for people uh, to um, clean out their uh, items and their belongings and, and uh, stuff that they just have not been able to um, get rid of uh, up until now. Uh, recently, the sixth ward donated uh, $15,000 to the school district 129 for the three new parks, uh, school parks in my ward for the Wally Smith playground at Hill School. Uh, the Smith School Playground that was just dedicated a couple weeks ago, and the Hope Wall School Playground that's going to be dedicated uh, soon. Um, we did cancel the Wards 4, 5, and 6 shred event for this year, but we, again, uh, we hope to reschedule it for 2021. Uh, the 6th Ward last year initiated public improvements to Taylor Street, uh, Morton Street, New Haven, uh, with the various uh, infrastructure improvements like driveway approaches, curb and gutter repairs in, in conjunction with the new resurfacing out there. So that was a big part of the improvements that we did in 2019. Uh, the Sixth Ward also donated uh, a grant for Simply Destiny for their new dance floor this year for the kids and their new dance space on Downer. 
Um, and uh, over the winter time, the latest uh, Aurora Habitat for Humanity House uh, was constructed and donated. Uh, it was an all woman build the first time, very significant, uh, and provides a nice home for a mother, her two young daughters and her and the grandmother. And they're all happily living there. Uh, it was a city funded uh, uh, initial project to acquire and demolish the old dilapidated home that was on there. And so now um, it's been great uh, for the neighborhood. I'd like to give you finally an update on the ukulele festival. Um, we have an energized ukulele committee and we didn't let the uh, pandemic stop the ukulele festival, although we, wasn't, we were not able to have it in person. Uh, the committee chose to live stream uh, the festival worldwide, August 23rd. Uh, in the process to be able to do that, the committee had to upgrade uh, their YouTube, Facebook, and ukulele website to be able to handle technology-wise this virtual event. Uh, and um, the, um, the committee decided they needed to, um, to build a better identity for Aurora and Aurora downtown, so they actually changed the name uh, to Aurora Uke Fest now. And it's become very well known nationwide in the ukulele uh, entertainment circles with people wanting uh, not only in America, but worldwide to come and perform and give wor workshops. Uh, the committee continues to partner with the venue every year to have quality ukulele entertainment that festival weekend in August. Uh, and during the live stream, there were, and get this, 21,676 people that streamed and viewed the live event. Now, I know that uh, uh, that goes from anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes to an hour uh, and up to six hours event. But the point is that people worldwide knew about Aurora. We put Aurora on the map. In fact, I want to mention to you where the worldwide viewers came. We only had 25% of the people from Illinois. So the rest came from uh, outside of, of our state. So we had worldwide viewers from the United Kingdom, Australia, Japan, South Korea, the United Arab Emirates, Vietnam, Puerto Rico, France, Great Britain, Hawaii, Qatar, Italy, and Canada. Uh, so the committee is very energized. They thought it was a successful first time event, uh, but they still hope to have it in person next year. Uh, and they're working towards um, continuing uh, having the, the festival and, and marketing uh, Aurora downtown. And that's the Sixth Ward uh, corner um, this evening, Mayor, and City and, Council. And it sounds like you got a whole lot going on in the Sixth Ward, brother. Yeah, and thank you. I'm excited to hear about the, uh, the ukulele fest exploding, you know, worldwide. So uh, I agree with you. I hope we can have it in person next, uh, next summer as well. And uh, that we attract all those people here to our city so they can uh, see how beautiful Aurora is. All right, well, thank uh, thank you very much, uh, Alderman Seville, great uh, Alderman's Corner. Uh, I think that's it for us tonight, folks. Um, if there are no motions to adjourn, uh, uh, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, made by Alderman Franco, seconded by okay. Alderman, second. Alderman Jenkins. Second, uh, with, yes. Will the clerk be call the roll? Alderman Yamas. <laughs> yes. Alderman Garza. Yes. Alderman Masiakos? Yes. Alderman Donnell? Yes. Alderman Franco? Yes. Alderman Seville? Yes. Alderman Hart Burns? Yes. Alderman Smith? Yes. Alderman Bug? Yes. Alderman Latte? Yes. Alderman Jenkins? Yes. Alderman O'Connor? Yes. 12 A's. All right, motion carries. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Good meeting all, and um, we got past our, our, our few bumps with our uh, technology there, but it ended up being a very good and informative mm -hmm. meeting. I'll see you all next week. Oh, yeah. Good evening. Thursday, Thursday. Uh, yes, Thursday at the uh, press conference. There you go.